This week at the agenda, examine the health of the province's PC party on the eve of a potentially troublesome convention in London, international reluctance to get involved in foreign conflicts, and the truth that can be found in fiction. The Agenda's Week in Review begins with the question, do Quebec's values match the rest of Canada's values? Watch. Uh, Daniel Turp, you know that this issue of the cross hanging out in the uh, National Assembly has been a bit of a big deal. Uh, we're taking a look at a picture of it right now. Can you explain how, on the one hand, it's a good idea to eliminate overt signs of religion, in the public sphere, but on the other hand, it's okay to have that cross hanging in the National Assembly. Well, it's not okay. I think, I believe it's inconsistent with the principle of neutrality. I'm on record in saying that the cross should not be in the National Assembly when legislators convene to make laws for everyone in Quebec. And uh, I, I agree with our, our colleague that, that that probably is seen by many Quebecers, including those who want a charter of values, as inconsistent. Uh, otherwise, the, the, the proposed charter will apply to all religions equally because people that are Catholics or, or Protestants, Christians, will not be able to wear crosses if they work for, for the government. Uh, so I, I think there is a need for, for more consistency, and I hope when the bill is tabled, uh, there is that uh, uh, consistency. So Priya, let me follow up with you, because uh, Professor Turb does make the point mm -hmm. that y you said uh, minority religions would be sort of disproportionately affected by this, but th the fact is you can't wear a big cross either, and obviously the vast majority of Quebecers are Catholic. Right. So how does this affect people who follow religions who are in the minority uh, more so than it does to those in the majority? Well, I mean, if you're a, a practicing Muslim or a, a practicing Muslim woman and you feel that part of your faith is to wear the hijab, that's not exactly something that you can take off from 9 to 5. That's something that you, if, and I don't think it's the government place to tell and any citizens how they should be practicing something that's so intimate, which is their own religion. Um, and you know what? The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms sort of agrees with me on this. But if you're a, if you're a, uh, a very fervent Catholic and it uh -huh. has been your practice to wear a large cross, you mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to do that either. You'd be affected just the same way, wouldn't you? Yeah, I suppose, but I mean, you're still allowed to wear a small cross. There's no such thing as a small hijab. Gotcha. David Cousins, is, uh, is that an inconsistency in what we're dealing with here? Yes, it is on uh, two, two reasons. Uh, first, uh, as I said, the, the, the state neutrality is an obligation imposed to the state. And affirming, affirming that we should ban some ostensible, symbol, ostensible symbols, the state uh, finally does not respect his obligation of neutrality. How the state, the secular state, uh, can uh, decide which symbol is ostensible or not. Uh, secondly, uh, how the state can decide uh, what skills a neutral state, a secular state, has to say that uh, a crucifix is not anymore a religious symbol. It's not because in Quebec uh, a majority of the uh, population does not go to the church anymore, does not practice anymore, that the symbol is cultural. And I would like to say when uh, uh, Daniel Turp argued that uh, the uh, majority will also uh, have to respect uh, this obligation of neutrality, that it's not exactly the case. Uh, who has an obligation to wear religious symbols? It's Muslim people and Muslim women who has to wear the hijab. It's the Sikh who has to wear the turban. But in the uh, Christian religions, there is not such an obligation. There is not such an obligation. I can decide to wear a religious symbol, symbol, but it's not imposed by a text. And we create a discrimination, which is not direct, but it is still a discrimination for the minorities. Well, Daniel Turp, can I get you to speak to that there? As in the way that David has, has explained it there, uh, the, the new practice would not be uh, equally in effect on Muslims as opposed to Christians. Is that a fair point? Well, you know, I think in, in many religions, including, including in Muslim uh, denominations and in others, uh, some people would not think and would not believe that uh, there is a, an obligation to wear a, a religious symbol at work, uh, for example. So 
I guess it, it, it does depend on your relationship with your own faith, with your, with your own church or uh, denomination, and people have very diverging views. It's not only Christians who don't believe that uh, they need to wear uh, crosses and religious symbols. The issue is, in fact, it, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult debate, I, I admit to the, it's a difficult debate, because it's the idea that when you work for this state, your religion should not be prominent, uh, and that, it, and it only if you work for the state, because this charter, these new rules, would only apply to those cases in your private life, in the life, uh, uh, in your home, in the street. Uh, contrary to other countries like France, who has decided that there shouldn't be many symbols even in in the public space. Quebec wants to have its state more neutral. It wants to have a, a secular state, and that could be seen as very inconsistent with uh, the Canadian charter or multiculturalism. But for Quebec, it seems reasonable, and it should have a margin of appreciation as a nation to provide for those new rules. Now, I do appreciate your position on this, but I just wonder when, when push actually comes to shove, how this policy gets rolled out. For example, if you are let's say a woman processing uh, you know, driver's license renewals in the Department of Motor Vehicles or whatever you call it in Quebec, and you want to wear the hijab, and you currently work for the state, do you lose your job going forward? Well, I don't know what's going to be in the legislation, as if there's going to be issues uh, dealing with acquired rights or a, a time frame in which you will have to adapt to the new policy. But obviously at the end, uh, the idea is that uh, people that work for the government uh, should not wear religious symbols, whatever the religion is. So uh, we'll see. And as you, as Mr. Drainville pointed out in the document, there might be also some exemptions for some institutions, universities, CGEPs, and uh, hospitals. So we'll we'll see. Those issues are, are not yet, I guess, decided, and we won't know until the the law is tabled in November or December. Understood. Okay. And Supri, I wonder if this is a, a potential opening here for some common ground. If, for example, they said. Here's our policy, but we'll exempt these various institutions, or perhaps, I don't know if they'd be prepared to go this far, but if you work for the state today, mm -hmm. you can get grandfathered in under this right. policy, but as soon as you leave, your replacement can't do it. Would that make some of this go away? I mean, it would certainly make the blow a, a little bit. It would soften the blow, definitely. But I, I, I think the fundamental problem with this is that you're telling people how to practice their religion. And I, I don't think the state has, has any place in, in that. So yes, you know, if, if let's say hospitals are exempt from this, universities are exempt, and people get grandfathered in, that, that's definitely better than the current position. Because as, as, as you know, I'm sure Ontario has been, a big, has been putting out a big campaign to lure Quebec doctors in. Um, and I, I think it would end up working. But at the end of the day, I just, I am very uncomfortable with the fact of having the government tell you how to practice religion. Well, you, know, you see, that's, that's an interesting point, because if, if the issue is practicing your religion, uh, should you be practicing your religion when you're working for the state, when the state is supposed to be separate from religions? Uh, and I think on that basis, one could argue that, no, you shouldn't. You shouldn't uh, be... Uh, 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 w wanting to practice your religion if you do choose to work for the state in a state that has decided it is neutral and that there is a separation between state and religion. Sure, and I mean, Professor Torp, I absolutely agree with you there, but at the end of the day, how can you really say that what's in somebody's mind, right? I, you're never going to be able to control what somebody's thinking and to, and to think that when somebody takes off their kippah and then they're then at their office, all of a sudden Judaism is no longer part of their identity or their thoughts is completely ridiculous. Well, I, I don't think it is ridiculous because it, there's something about the workplace and about your duty as a civil servant of the state and the idea that uh, that is uh, as important as uh, your religious beliefs. And that's why you see that there, there is a big debate. Some people want to make a case 
about their religion and wearing religious symbols even if they're working for the state. Uh, and I think that is, is something that can leg legitimately be said as not uh, desirable in, in, in a state. Whether to act on Syria is the subject of great debate across the globe, coupled with growing reluctance of Western countries to get involved in conflicts outside their own borders. Joining us now for more on the latest developments and what's behind this shift in San Francisco, California. Ian Bremer, he's president of Eurasia Group, a global political risk research and consulting firm. He's also the author of Every Nation for Itself, Winners and Losers in a G-Zero World. And with us here in studio, Besma Momani. She is professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Waterloo's Balsillie School of International Affairs and non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution. And Jana Stein, director of the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto and TVO's Foreign Affairs Analyst. And it's good to have you two back in the studio. Ian Bremer, nice to have you on our television station tonight from the left coast. And let me start with you because Fred Kaplan of Slate Magazine has argued that the U.S.-Russia deal that's currently on the table, he calls it a win-win for everybody except the Syrian people. Is he right about that? Well, uh, I suppose that's true. Uh, it's, it's a win for the United States if you care really only about domestic U.S. policy. Uh, it's not a win for American credibility around the world, but Obama's made it very clear that Syria is not a high priority U.S. foreign policy is not a high priority. He wants to uh, focus on what his constituents want. He wants to focus on the domestic economy. Uh, getting involved in Syria was never popular, and it's become only less popular um, after Obama set the red line and then made it look like uh, strikes were imminent. Uh, the Russian deal is uh, not necessarily a credible deal. It's not necessarily a great off-ramp. But Obama just wanted an off-ramp, and he's found himself one. Uh, I certainly agree with Fred, though, uh, that it is very clearly not a win uh, for the Syrian people. It is a win for Bashar Assad. And if you're Russia, I suppose it's more of a win for Putin personally than it is for Russia, because it's not clear to me, like with, like with Snowden, for example, it's not clear to me that the win you have with uh, maintaining support of Bashar Assad Syria is one you necessarily want to be saddled with over the long term. Besma, uh, if it's a win-win for everybody except the Syrian people, that's not a very good deal, is it? No, but it's a fantastic deal, definitely, for Assad. I mean, basically, the Americans have thrown the opposition and the rebels under the bus. And I think that what we've seen here is Assad not just being legitimated by the international community, but also he is necessary now for the disarmament process. You need a functioning regime like the Assad government who will be able to have Syrian military not only protect the inspectors in disarming, but also be able to tell them where they are provide them the access, and presumably we know that this is all being held in Syrian government territory, not in rebel-held territory, you need a functioning government. And anybody who thinks this is going to be done anytime soon is, is kidding ourselves. This is a years in process. Basically, with this deal, we have basically bought the Assad regime for at minimum three to nine years. And I think that really is a victory for Assad and completely makes the rebels sidelined by any negotiations at the moment. Certainly the initial reaction out of the rebel camps that people have been able to glean is one of complete dismay and disillusion. Absolutely. Fair to say? They, they are the big losers, but, you know, life is imperfect. Um, and let's just understand that if there had been a military strike, it's very unlikely that anything would have been done about the chemical weapons. You couldn't hit the chemical weapons. It's too dangerous in terms of the impact. And it's conceivable that after one Steve, Assad survives it, thumbs his nose, and goes ahead and uses them again. So there are winners here and there are losers, but you do not have a perfect world. This deal just to defend it for a moment, because no one else is, stands the best chance of getting those chemical weapons under international supervision identified, counted, and removed from the control of Assad. Uh, but President Obama said not that long ago that Assad has to go. Yeah. Does this deal help that? No. So the, yeah. he said two things, right? He said there's a red line with respect to chemical weapons. Well, this deal does help that. Assad has to go. Busman's absolutely right. Assad is here to stay. He's an important part now um, of implementing this regime and getting those weapons under some sort of control. So you have to decide, and, he, and Obama did, which was more important. And it was clear right from the beginning with him. He was never going to intervene in civil war. 
he was going to do something about the chemical weapons. Ian, do you think that this plan is actually going to do what it hopes to do? There are a lot of stumbles well, and obstacles between here and the middle of 2014, which is when it's supposed to be done by. What are the odds on this actually happening? Oh, no, the odds are low. Uh, I, I agree that uh, it may be the best chance to get the chemical weapons under control. That doesn't mean it's a good chance. I think Obama knows that. Again, the priority was not to have to proceed with military strikes that weren't going to accomplish much and that were going to be very unpopular. Uh, it, it's not as if there's any trust for the Russians here uh, to actually get it done. I do believe that it makes it more likely that chemical weapons won't be used again, at least not in a systematic way, uh, by the Assad regime, and certainly not anytime soon. I think some chemical weapons will probably be handed over some sites, you'll probably see some inspectors. That's very different from saying uh, by the middle of 2014 uh, that uh, we're actually going to see all of these things destroyed. Um, you know, the Russians own this now, uh, as in Colin Powell's famous words. Um, so You break it, you own it. You break it, you own it. They own this now. So I, I actually don't envy them. One, he cannot use chemical weapons. He just can't. Uh, because the Russians will wear it. Secondly, the Russians have a very strong interest in getting some control over the chemical weapons because they're worried that they will leak to some of the jihadists. Uh, and so they see a direct connection there. So, yeah, of course it's not going to be a perfect deal and not all of them will go. But effectively what this deal does is make the Russians play on limiting and eliminating the use of chemical weapons. As I say in the vernacular, that ain't nothing. <laughs> Syria is hugely in the news, and your organization is there, and you were there. When were you there? I'm just back last Saturday. I was three weeks in the region, including in Iraq, inside Syria, and in Lebanon and Jordan. Give us a sense of what you saw. Inside the country, um, the medical system has all but collapsed. It's extremely difficult for people to get uh, medical care, even to meet the basics of, of everyday life. And there are tens of thousands of people in transit camps who are blocked along the borders who can't get refugee status. They can't get across the border. They can't go home because the fighting is, is too intense. And speaking with them, they had two huge fears. One was the, the ongoing fighting. Every once in a while, the planes fly over the refugee camps and they just open up fire. Uh, Syrian army planes. Just open up fire, uh, not to do a lot of damage, just to, to remind you that they're there. They, they do the same over some of our clinics, one of our clinics. I, I saw the boat holes on the outside the extremeter wall where they'd done the same. But they feared the conflict violence, and they also feared the winter in equal measure because they had been already through one winter in very difficult conditions. Uh, they have tents that aren't insulated. The assistance levels are fluctuate. They're down to two meals a day. They're living in very difficult conditions, and they just don't understand uh, how it is that the international community hasn't responded more to their suffering and to their needs. Well, that's interesting. You look at the events of the last couple of weeks, and you've seen how the debate has percolated through the American houses of government and so on. And, and uh, if you were over there, what would you tell people about why the world is sitting back and uh, well, I, I don't doing have, what it's doing? I don't have an answer to them on, on the why not. And that's a very difficult question when they say, don't people know? And when you have to tell them that, yes, they do know, uh, but at least I can tell them I'm going to come back, and I am going to talk uh, on shows like this, and I am going to talk to, to government. But what we've seen with this with this diplomatic uh, fury in the last few weeks is at least uh, you can see that results can be had, discussions can be had. And what's amazing to us is how tens of thousands of people had, have died in aerial bombardments that have uh, not disseminated, be, not distinguished, sorry, between uh, civilian and military targets that have been indiscriminate, which are also uh, illegal in conflict. Uh, we've seen how the health system has collapsed and we haven't seen any any answer to that, there's uh, so little aid getting through into Syria. And so we need the same type of diplomatic uh, fury, if you like, around humanitarian issues, around the, protection issues. My hunch is, though, that the world assumes that when you're in the midst of a civil war where 100,000 people are dead, 2 million people uh, put into flight, that it's, that it's kind of impossible to make any progress on the kinds of issues you're talking about. Is that accurate? I don't think so. We're, we're proof that you can operate inside Syria. We have six surgical hospitals and maternity wards operating inside Syria and four health clinics with international teams. I'm not saying that it's easy. It is a challenge, uh, but it can be done. And in areas where we can't secure uh, full permissions, we're supporting another 26 hospitals and 46 health centers. So aid can get in. It's about uh, having the desire to do so. The surrounding countries 
haven't declared emergencies, despite the huge burden they're facing uh, with the refugees on their population. And so aid agencies can't get in to, to work. They're not getting visas. They're not getting approved. Other agencies could come, but they don't have that access. When you say permission, do you need permission from the Assad government to be in there? Well, we've sought permission from, uh, from the government to work out of Damascus, but we've not been able to get that permission. So we've just gone ahead and worked cross-border. And we've encouraged other organizations to do the same. So you have no legal standing or papers or that kind of thing to be there? No, we just go where the needs are, and, uh, and uh, that's where you'll find us. Do you have any kind of relationship with, uh, now admittedly, there's not much of the country that's held by the rebel side at this point, but do you have any relationship with them or contact with them that allows you to work in areas where they're relatively in control? Yeah, we always work uh, in two ways. When we're working directly present, we work through community acceptance. So we talk to all the rebel leaders, we talk to government leaders, we talk to community elders, and we basically tell them, we'll bring our assistance if you at least uh, uh, don't attack us, if you tell us what uh, insecurity might lie, and if you basically help be part of our security guarantee package. That doesn't mean that they protect us directly. Mm -hmm. It just means that they know what we're doing and uh, that they'll try to at least allow that uh, to the best of their abilities. Do they want you there? Um, generally in conflict, uh, they do. Uh, it's not always the case, uh, but mo even the most hardened rebels I've seen in Afghanistan, I've seen in other countries, the most hardened rebels can generally understand that children need vaccinations, that their wives need a, a safe place to give birth. And so there is an underlying humanity that, that can be uh, built and a humanitarian space that can be built on conflict. Our, our whole organization is built around part of that premise. Since the 2011 election, there have been seven by-elections in the province of Ontario, and the Conservatives have won one. One out of seven. And the one they won was Doug Holliday. So everybody's giving him the credit as opposed to the leader or the party. Uh, how much of that will be percolating in the convention in London? Well, I think it will actually be the principal argument. Uh, you know, it's a difficult to advance the argument that Maggie, uh, advan Maddie advanced with respect to, you know, charisma and so on, because one person's charisma is another person's, you know, non-charisma. But mm -hmm. what you can point to is facts and say, well, look, in these by-elections, not that they, a lot of them were liberal seats. However, mm -hmm. you also have the Liberal Party at a point when they should be at their absolute lowest of the low with the scandals and the state of the economy even that affects governments negatively. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I come back and sort of say, well, let's not have a gang obsession on Tim Hudak and say, aha, you only won one out of seven, you should go. But I would expect that he would have done more than he has done in the aftermath of the latest five to say, well, clearly, the plan we have in place and the team we have in place is not exactly what the doctor ordered because we would have done better. I'm not saying they should have won all seven, but they probably should have won at least, say, two or three. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they didn't. So to me, that's indicative of something where when we had the chance to sort of go out there and where people know they have a freebie, they're not going to change the government. Uh, they, they decided not to pick us. And so, you know, to me, that's one of the things I think he has to acknowledge without getting into the, into the dust and the dirt with the people who are doing this. But say, look, I know some things have to change, and that includes a bit with me, and I'm going to work hard at that, but also some of our policies and some of our approaches and perhaps even some of our team because we haven't done as well as we should have done in those by-elections. If, if I can say, say something, Steve, um, this is, it's almost redundant. I mean, he, this is what Tim Hudak said in the last... Uh, convention in 2000 and uh, was it 11? After the last provincial right. election. Right, so, yeah. so he, he, he gave that speech, we're going to change our policies, I'm going to do better, I'm going to reach out more. And that those by-elections were proof of the status quo. I haven't seen it. Now I could speak with some authority on policy because I have actually, I'm one of those people that actually did attend some of the grassroots sessions around, on, around t Toronto. Um, I wasn't really, I, I looked at the policy, it didn't really, it wasn't very appealing to me. And as a mother, you know, I've got three children. Um, as a woman, especially, I think that one of the problems that Tim has, and this is going to be a big challenge, is that he does not, he's up against two females. And if you look at that, you know, you've got one man who's attacking females, that, that, that perception alone is not a good one. There was, I think you wrote about it in your blog, the statistics, 85% of Ontarians want a female leader or at least they would, uh, they, they would like to have. 85, these were Greg Lyle's numbers, whom right. we're having on later, who said that when, when he did polling, 85% of Ontarians thought it was pretty cool that we have a female premier. Right, okay. So, but that, that's very telling. So he's got that one challenge, but I think that uh, the policy is, is important. I, I, I think that they need, and I wrote about this in one of my columns, education is a big file. And what we're hearing in, about education is mostly the fighting between the unions and 
uh, the, the, the uh, uh, Working Families Coalition. And to the average person who's you know, going to work every day and dropping their kids off, they don't understand that. What you need to do is touch, uh, it, it's, you had mentioned you've got to inspire somebody to vote. I'm not inspired to vote if, I, if I'm hearing you know, code words like e-health and gas plant scandals and unions. And I don't understand that. I, well, I, I, I think I that's one, one of the one biggest... One more code thing, because mm -hmm. I think it's important. And I'll say it here because it needs to be said in the interest of our party, which is that last time in the campaign in 2011, there were some codes used, not even codes, about foreign workers and about gay Ontarians. Mm -hmm. And they were used quite repeatedly and therefore as part of a conscious strategy. And they left some very bad aftertaste in the minds of people who would think on that basis alone they might exclude the PC party as an option. It's 2013. Mm -hmm. This party needs to win seats in 905 and 416 where last time I checked, uh, you know, 50% of the people who live here were born somewhere else. And a lot of people are very embracing of the fact we are diverse, including gay people and, and, and lots of immigrants and so on. And I, I think the party has not done that again, but I think it hasn't at the same time sort of reached out to those people. Tim has made some personal efforts, I will say that. Mm -hmm. But the party itself has not wiped away the lingering odor of that stuff, which I thought was disgraceful, frankly. John, John McIntyre, there was a time when a guy with your last name would not have been very welcomed in the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party. And now people that, with... That's kind of not just unique to the party. My dad mm -hmm. was the first ethnic... Uh, president of the local Lions Club. So yeah, I know the culture shift. But what has Tim Hudak done, I guess, in the last couple of years to, as John Tory suggests here, turn the channel on the foreign workers business, the, anti, the campaign that was uh, run against gay Torontonians? Um, what's he done to make people who are female or ethnic or have a sexual orientation different from the mainstream uh, to make them feel more comfortable in this party? I wouldn't be the person to ask to be a spokesman for Tim, but I'd suggest that it's been going to uh, a very far-reaching policy process. Um, it's, you know, when Mike Harris won way back in another century, the reality was Mike won for the fundamental issues that every mother, every kid understood, pocketbook issues. Right? That's what it was about. So the, the policies that he's been addressing so far have been wide-reaching. Now. What's the plan going to be? Uh, I mean, I had an opportunity to speak to him at a delegate meeting uh, a week ago. And one of the things I suggested was, let's get to the platform. Let, let's, let's boil all this down. Let's get to you know, five things that we can go out there so everybody knows what we're talking about. And people can know they're either going to support or they're not going to support and they'll go away. Well, let me follow up with John Capabianco on that. Because if part of what John Tory would like to see is a party that abandons some of its more right-wing tendencies and moves more into the middle, more into the, if I can put it this way, the Bill Davis tradition of the party, the big blue machine, the red Tory. Tim Hudak can't really do that, can he? I mean, that's repudiating everything he stands for. I think at the end of the day, what you have to do as a party leader is actually espouse what you believe as a leader and as a party that you think is best to take this province to a new direction. And I think to what John was saying about some of the policies that happened in the last election, well, he paid for it. He lost the election as a result of some of the policies. Mm -hmm. And I remember when John was leader of the party, some of the policies that he had were particularly f favorable with the electorate, and he lost. So, you know, I think it's important to sort of understand and learn from the past, but it's also to move on to the future. And, and Matty says something about the policies. Well, we're not sure about his policies. Well, he's got 14 white papers, mm -hmm. the most that anybody's ever had as far as party leader is, is concerned, as far as bringing them out, discussing them with party members, having the media and having, you know, Ontarians discuss them and debate them. And that's what this policy conference is about. Well, you've got to hand it to him for putting out serious policy plus, ideas. You may not like them, but they're out there. Plus, he has over 40 policy advisory committees actively working and coming up with submissions and new ideas and thoughts, which, again, are going to be talked about but in this they're convention. Not, if I hear Maddie correctly and if I hear John Tory correctly, they are not welcoming to women and they are not welcoming to the red Tory well, faction of the party so that used to be in charge. Everybody would say this, and I was a 416 candidate. Not unsuccessfully, but I was a 416 candidate. So I get the 416 feel, and I, get, I understand the whole urban-rural divide. Um, the fact of the matter is, and people will say that he didn't win four, uh, four, uh, won one of the five by-elections. Well, one out of seven. Well, he won Toronto. And he won Toronto pretty big with, with, Doug, with Doug Holiday. Did and he win it? Huge, well, you know what? He did win it. And if you're going to blame Tim Hudak. I know Hudak, that's your old writing, but, and you know it better than I do. But, but did, did but he Steve, win that or Doug Holiday win gonna it? If you're going to blame Tim Hudak for losing four others, then give him the right to, to, to lay claim for the fact that that's he won fair. one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> that is what, and he won one. And, and by the way, he was the one that actually attracted Doug Holiday. Doug Holiday ran for mm -hmm. us, not because of the Conservative Party brand, because of Tim Hudak and who he believed as a leader and could be the next premier. That's why Doug Holiday won. And I can tell you, with some level of assurances, that's the case. 
The character of Colleen Kerrigan struggles daily with her alcohol addiction, something that's mirrored in the life of her creator, author Lauren B. Davis. And here now to tell us how fiction can sometimes get to the truth more easily than a memoir, Lauren B. Davis, author of The Empty Room, and we're very happy to have you here at TVO with us tonight. Do you want to tell us a little bit about why you decided to do this in novel form as opposed sure. to memoir? Well, I think, you know, novels and memoirs have very different narrative arcs. And, you know, with a memoir, it's all about how the events contained in the memoir contributed to the memoirist becoming who he or she became, mm -hmm. right? That, those, those specific events, right? It's not the story of a life, it's those specific events. And novel, fictional characters are much more involved in transformation, which is not to say there isn't transformation in memoir, there sometimes is. But you come at it from a different place, and you have, I think, more objectivity when you're working in fiction. Um, you know, often uh, with writers that I'm teaching, emerging writers that I'm teaching, you know, I'll say, you know, that, that character, that section, that's not working. And they'll say, but that's what happened. That, that's exactly what happened in real life. And I say, well, I'm sorry, but it doesn't have the dramatic impact. It doesn't have the narrative arc you need. And so sometimes you have to be able to get away, I think, from the facts, if you will, to get at the truth. And fiction lets you do that. And fiction lets you do that. And one of the stories I love to tell is that, you know, you know how everybody talks about the 1936 World Olympics and Hitler in Berlin, in Berlin and Hitler refused to to uh, shake Jesse, to Owens, shake Jesse Owens hand. Well, apparently that never happened. Right? <laughs> it's a great story. And, and Jesse Owens now, in fact, well, it, later in life, it, admitted that that never happened. What apparently had happened is that Hitler's uh, handlers the day before, when another black American athlete had won an award, I can't remember what his name was, forgive me, um, and Hitler had to leave because he had other things to do. He was a very busy man, after all. And so there was a bit of a hue and cry over this. And his handler said, you know, look, you can't do this. You've either got to go to everything or nothing. And he said, OK, I'm going to nothing, because I can't go to everything. And that's and so, why. And that was why he didn't shake Jesse Owens' hand. Now, those are the facts. They, they but that actually doesn't tell the truth. I was just going to say, it's actually less indicative exactly. of what the guy really was Precisely. all about. Right. So we're better to go with the fiction than the fact? I am. You are. <laughs> I am. You know, I think, I I, I think for me, that's, that's the world I, I work in. That's the way things make sense to me. You know, Joan Didion, who, of course, doesn't write fiction much, uh, more known for nonfiction, she talks about how if she had access to her own mind, she wouldn't write. And she <laughs> writes to find out what she thinks about things. And, mm. and that's pretty much what I do with fiction, is mm. I take something that's bugging me, something that's obsessing me, some question that I have that I can't figure out the answer to, and I start playing with the what ifs and what kind of a person and what would happen when. And the next thing you know, a character begins to form and that character begins to have a story. And those stories take me places that I think I've probably been composting in my subconscious for a long time. Composting. And, outcome, and, outcomes, and outcomes the story. Let me follow up on something you said a while yeah. ago, though, about being more objective when you, when you work in fiction as opposed right. to fact. I would have thought it was the other way around because the threat of a lawsuit really does force you to be very objective about the people you're writing about, doesn't it? Well, I don't know. I mean, I've never, I've never written memoir, and I, you know, I don't really write. I write blogs, but I don't really write nonfiction. I think, you know, there are people um, in my novels who are who are based loosely inspired by, mm. really inspired by, people I've known in my life. What's interesting is that those people never recognize themselves. Mm. And I think that, again, goes back to this composting process. Mm. When, when an author takes someone they know and, for fictional reasons, allows them to sort of live in the subconscious, by the time that comes back out onto the page, that person really isn't the human, the real living human being anymore. They are then this creation. Oh, the Somerset mom said, you know, novelists aren't God. We don't create out mm -hmm. of nothing, mm -hmm. right? So we always bring into it a little bit of what we've seen, a little bit of this person, a little bit of that person. What convinced you that there was uh, not reportage, but rather a fictional story to be told around the whole Nigerian internet scam 419 business? Well, the, the real story is so, is so fascinating, the, the story behind 419. So a lot of the book is based on real case studies, real transcripts, real crimes. I think what snagged my attention um, 
was the idea that, that this email scam can go, it can be traced back to the days of Shakespeare. You can trace this back to the Elizabethan era. And that's what really, I think, grabbed my attention was the idea that what we're seeing with the, what we're seeing is, is a modern manifestation uh, of a very, very old scam. Okay, if it were 419 in Nigeria today, what would, a, what would Shakespearean times be the equivalent of? Well, it wouldn't be email, obviously. Right. But uh, in the wake of the Spanish Armada in 1588, a lot of English, even though England won and defeated Spain, a lot of um, English noblemen drowned, disappeared, were swept out to sea. And soon after, not emails, but quill and ink letters began to circulate. And if you read them, they're uncannily similar to what we get today. It's, Dear Sir, I am the daughter of an imprisoned English nobleman <laughs> who has an immense fortune. He needs just a small amount up front to bribe his captors. It's an advance fee fraud, and it, it's as old as time. Just goes to show you there's nothing new under the sun ever, is there? No. Huh. No. Uh, of course, uh, the 419 scam was um, perfected in Nigeria. Today you can find it coming out of uh, Ukraine, Amsterdam, the U.S., but it was uh, in Nigeria that was really perfected. That's why it, the, the name 419, as you mentioned, comes from the Nigerian Criminal Code. Uh, it's sometimes called the Nigerian uh, scam just because they were, I think the Nigerian, Nigerians were the first to really understand the potential of the Internet age and what you could do with it. Hmm. Your they were early adapters. Early, ad <laughs> early adapters, that's nice. Yes. Uh, your, your protagonist, Henry Curtis, I wonder if you could go into the qualities that he has that you think makes him, in the book, an ideal candidate to be on the receiving end of this scam. Yes. The novel, I, again, I should mention, it is fictional. It's not a how-to guide. I don't want people to think they should go to Nigeria like the character does. Basically, an older, an older fellow dies, gets caught up in a 419 scam, dies, and his daughter decides to go to Nigeria and track down the people she feels is responsible for her father's death. Again, not something you should do. The case of her father is based on an actual case study that I read. Uh, what makes him a target, he's an older retired shop teacher, and um, he's not very tech savvy. Um, and unfortunately, the sad truth is that these con artists very often target senior citizens uh, for several reasons. They're, they're sitting on savings. They often own their own home. They, they often tend to be a bit lonely. Um, they uh, are more trusting. and. Uh, as I mentioned, they're not as tech savvy as, as others. So they do tend to target seniors. And the, the victim in the book is a senior citizen. So you add up all those qualities, and that makes them particularly vulnerable to this kind of entreaty. Is that it? Yes, unfortunately so. Hmm. And how about the use of typos or grammatical errors in these email notes? How does that add to the authenticity of the, of the scam? Well, as I researched 419, I realized there's actually a controversy uh, in the people, the crime investigators on 419. And, it's whether these intentional typos that we get, because they're always riddled with typos and bad English, is whether they're intentional or not. And there's two schools of thought. One is that these formats that they send out, they, they mass mail them, and then uh, they're working on the spam principle. You know, if you send out a million spams, you don't need a million responses to make it worthwhile. You really just need one. Uh, so the idea is that these formats have been around for so long, and they work, so they don't want to tinker with them. And the original ones are poorly written, so hence they, they repeat them. The other school of thought, which I'm not sure if I'm convinced, but is that they're intentionally poorly written because the person you really want to snag is someone who's greedy. Um, the character in my book is not greedy, but the ones they want to get are the greedy ones. And they read a, an email full of typos and mistakes, and they, they think this semi illiterate rube from Africa, I'll take this guy for everything. Because remember, the, the, the core of the scam is that they're going to move, say, $20 million into your bank account, and you're going to keep 10% or 20% mm -hmm. or 15%. But there is a certain type of person who thinks, what's stopping me from keeping all of it? And the, the idea is that these poorly written emails kind of pander to people who are very, very greedy and who th are thinking they're smarter than uh, the 419 con artist. And what you really want in a mark, if you're a con artist, is you want them to think they're smarter than you. That's hmm. always a good thing if you're a scammer. That is The Agenda's Week in Review. You can see all of those programs in their entirety on our website, theagenda.tvo.org, or on our iTunes channel, or on the YouTube channel.
youtube.com slash the agenda. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.